It's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Robert Gish. He is, the, uh, since 2013, the president of uh, the uh, uh, professor of clinical medicine at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He's the medical director at St. Joe's Hospital in Phoenix, and he's also the medical director of the Hepatitis B Foundation. Dr. Gish, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the podium. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. I've got a number of my business cards. I'm now working at Stanford, and this has got my email address and phone number. So um, maybe I'll just put it up here on the front uh, table at the end, and people can grab my card if you would like. The other thing you can do is if you go to robertgish.com, you can sign up for my newsletter. It comes out every month, and it's definitely patient-directed, advocacy-directed. And then there's some typical um, technologic things that come out also that are directed to uh, physicians and providers. And I want to recognize the uh, wonderful talk by my previous speaker, but just wanted to update pronunciation for a moment. Uh, Provigil is what we describe the older medication for energy. And new vigil is the newer one. This is a slight modification. And vigil comes from being vigilant, being awake, being aware. Uh, I don't want to use the word vigilante because that might not have the right connotation. <laughs> but pro vigil, new vigil. Um, and I have used these medications extensively when. People have the financial resources to pay for them. I think they're somewhere around 11 or $15 a pill if you pay cash. And that's even if you try to go to one of those websites that has generic forms. So they're quite expensive and the insurance companies have not been too interested in covering them. But definitely people have day-night sleep reversal and you know shift work problems in other ways. So there are methods to try to get that medication to your patients. So what I want to really start off with, instead of rolling through my 80 PowerPoint slides, which might put everybody to sleep eventually because there's so many numbers and everything on here, I want to know from you, what are the hot topics in liver transplantation to you as a patient? I'm going to start out with Q&A and then go through some of my slides. So what? What are bothering you? Raise your hand. Do we have a wandering microphone that people can use? Is there a mobile mic? The, the microphone that's in that stand is a wireless. Okay. Maybe what we could do is if there's a, another mic I could use up here on the stand, if I can get this thing out of here. There we go. And I'm going to come down into the audience because I can show you lots of numbers and lots of updates, but if I'm not answering your questions, I'm not doing a very good job. So let's start with my friend here. And I'm going to tell everybody uh, maybe your name or where you're from or something, but go for it. I'm Dina from Omaha. UNOS is, is a system for allocating livers uh, based on MELD scores. And those of us with chronic diseases like PBC are disadvantaged, I believe, by that system. We're pretty bad before we get a high enough MELD score. And by then, everything else is falling apart, too. Um, is there any way to deal with that, number one? And number two, apparently the number of live donors is going down because there's problems. Could you talk about that? All right, so let's start out with the first question. Are PBC patients really disadvantaged? Um, and we'll, get, we'll just save this for the next person. Do you want to be my mic, mic, my mic person? Bet. Okay. So the truth is, is that the disadvantage that PBC patients had five or 10 years ago with the MELD system has disappeared. And why that's disappeared is, is that we've shifted to a new allocation system. And that's called MELD Share 15, and then MELD Share 35. And I'll have some slides on that later. But right now, the law says sickest first. And sickest first in many parts of the country are people who are sitting in the hospital, even sitting in the ICU, waiting for a liver transplant. These are people with MELD scores over 35. Everybody here is familiar with MELD? M-E-L-D, Model for End Stage Liver Disease. And it's a calculation of bilirubin, creatinine, which is a ki kidney function test, 
and a coagulation test called INR. Three very simple lab tests, really hard to manipulate or fudge. And people with MELD scores over 35 and 35 to 40 is kind of the top tier. Those people are going to die in the next two to six weeks. And the new system that started 12 months ago gives patients in that group top priority. And a PVC patient could be in that group, could be hepatitis C, could be something with uh, acute liver failure from hepatitis A. So the playing field from that perspective is very level. You all have to get pretty sick to get a liver in, in most areas of the country. The reasoning is, is that there's 12 to 14,000 people on the list and there's 6,000 livers. So the federal government said we don't want people prioritized because of ethnic, race, gender. They want sickest first. And you are all going to get, if you get the sickest first, you will obtain allocation on how ill you are. So PBC patients were a little disadvantaged in the past because of the way the MELD score was calculated and they kicked out the disease diagnosis as one of the prioritization um, tools and they kicked out what race you were. Those things actually influenced who died. And they said, we're going to make this simple, we're going to make this uh, a mathematical formula and it's going to be sickest first. So that is gone and now they're allocating. What is the biggest discrimination though in the country about organs is geography. If you live in New Orleans, you're going to get a liver long before you would get a liver if you're in Los Angeles. Hmm. So the discrimination right now is geography, which equals socioeconomic discrimination. Because if you're a poor person in LA and you can't get to New Orleans, your risk of dying is 20%. If you're in New Orleans, or you can fly to New Orleans and you've got the money, your risk of dying on the list is 3%. So that's the problem in the US today, which is being fixed. And I'll get back to what the next fix is. The second question you had was, or something else about? Live donors. Live donors. So what's happened with live donation and one of the reasons I recently moved to Stanford is because my previous two organizations did not do live donor transplants. Stanford's done over 50 adult to adult live donor transplants with no deaths in the recipients or the donors. So I wanted to work at a place that had live donors and had good results and had good volume. So live donation is on the upswing. I've been in San Francisco for the last five days with the World Transplant Congress. And at every meeting, at every session, people are saying we need to do more live donor transplants. And there will be more that will be done. There is now an upswing. There's more momentum. There's more younger, aggressive surgeons. Some of the old surgeons in the transplant world didn't believe in live donor. They didn't do them. They said, oh, we'll get deceased donors, but that's not the case. We're having 15 to 20% of people dying on the transplant list. So live donation is on the upswing, and that is good news. We should be doing 2,000 a year, not two to 400, but people have to donate, people have to be in good health. There's a lot of issues about live donation, some technical issues, but it is going to get better. A little bit better or a lot better? Next question. Where does quality of life fit in with the MELD score? No quality of life issues fit into the MELD score because people don't die of quality of life. It's sickest first. Who's going to die in the next two weeks to six weeks? That's who's going to get the next organ. Quality of life won't be folded in. It's sad. We know you have low quality of life. We know people have fatigue. We know PBC patients have more fatigue than probably any other form of liver disease relative to the stage of liver disease. But you can't give somebody a liver because they're not feeling well when they're going to die in five years when this person's going to die in two weeks. I'm sad, but that's, the way we are. that's where we are now. The future might get better because we might start printing organs and generating enough organs for everybody. People are working on that. I'm not being sarcastic at all. But that's probably five to ten years away. We'll grow organs. We'll you know, make things that 
people can get a transplant at a, at a better time. Where's the next mic? Is there any age limit on when you can receive a transplant? So the question is age limit, and I would say in general right now, centers are getting critical when people get over 60 and really critical when you're around 70 or 72, but there's no hard age limit. Uh, bigger centers tend to be a little bit more aggressive, meaning they'll have a little higher age limit for both donors and recipients, uh, but there is no hard cutoff. I'm next, I think. Being that um, we don't have enough livers to go around as it is, if you're going to use the criteria of giving it to the sickest patient first, is it that the patient, though, that will probably have the most hard time recovering or I would think. So your question is if you are really sick are you more likely to die after the transplant and waste the organ? And the answer is no. We are phenomenally skilled at most centers, not every center, but I'm saying the majority of liver transplant centers of taking really good care of sick people up to the time of transplant and have them survive afterwards. Now, I'm saying you, I'm telling you most. One out of five, one out of seven centers isn't very good at doing that. And most of those centers are in these places where they've been getting lots of livers and giving them to people that aren't so sick. With the new distribution system, this meld share 35, the pressures on these smaller centers that aren't so skilled is either go out of business or get better. And how do we do that? The US government monitors quality at all the transplant centers. And if you're in the bottom 25%, you're under the microscope. They're always going after the bottom 25% to push them up. There always will be a bottom 25%, right? Because that's the way the thing works in life. There's always the top 25 and the bottom 25. But the US government, you know, OPTN is really focused on quality. And they have shut down programs for having bad quality. So there's somebody out there policing organ transplant quality. In my opinion, they're doing a pretty good job. Not perfect. There's healed humans running the show. It's not a bunch of robots. Um, and that will really help quality get better. And that will help survival. And then what's happened with this MeldShare 35 has been this magic for the last 12 months where we had somebody sick in California, where I work most of the time, sitting in the ICU for six weeks waiting for a liver. And by six weeks, their kidneys have shut down. And then they need a liver and a kidney transplant. That's almost completely disappeared because those MeldShare over 35 are getting livers in three days to a week not waiting six weeks. And guess how much money it costs to be in the ICU every day? Probably $20,000 a day. So we're gonna spend $200,000 in 10 days. And if they're in there six weeks, we might spend half a million dollars keeping that person alive. So what's gonna happen in the next two years, now I'm getting, I'm now stretching out just a little bit because I can't predict the future. I thought it was Yogi Berra who said that, but it was somebody else. The most difficult thing to do is predict the future, right? But what is going to happen is they're going to redistribute organs in the United States in the next two to three years. They're going to redraw all these geographic boundaries and distribute organs much more fairly. So the rich person like Steve Jobs can't fly to Tennessee to get on a list to get a liver earlier. It's not going to be perfect, and California is still going to be the worst place to be waiting for a liver transplant. But in general, the playing field will be very level. Now, they are going to spend more money flying livers around on jets, OK? Because it's $15 a mile or something. But they're going to save huge amounts of money by not having somebody sit in an ICU for six weeks. So the money savings by drawing um, well, probably it's going to, I think it's going to be four regions. 
will be more than offset by the massive healthcare savings on the front end, and that sick person's not going to have to wait six weeks in the hospital in many centers. So there's really good news just around the corner. There's going to be open comment periods. There's going to be publications. There'll be a chance for you to get on the internet as a patient and make comments on this. And I've got a lot of data in my slides if we have time to get to that. If not, my slides I'm going to give to the PVCers, and you can look at my slide deck and look through all my comments. Really technical slides, but they give you the data on what the new rules are going to probably look like. Where's the microphone? Right here. Okay. Um, if you have other illnesses besides PVC, like, you know, other things, does that make you less of a candidate or does it impact your candidacy? The more complex you are as a patient, the more comorbidities, that's our great medical term that we use, if you got diabetes, heart disease, uh, you can't see, you lost a leg, everything is put into that formula on whether you're a good candidate or not. Um, if you had a melanoma last week, you're unlikely to get a liver transplant. Unlikely. Melanomas come back. I'm just kind of giving you the worst, worst diagnosis just to start off with. Uh, but on the other hand, if you've got high blood pressure and a little diabetes, doesn't mean that much unless you've had a heart attack or a heart problem. If you've had a stroke recently, you're not a good candidate for a liver transplant. So it really depends on what the diagnoses are, how many there are, and then we look at age. But we don't look at your age age, we look at your biologic age. If you're 65 going on 45, because like you heard from our previous speaker, you're exercising and you're active, you look much better than a 65-year-old who can't get out of bed 23 hours out of the day. We want people to be able to walk, talk, be functioning, be in good nutritional health. I think the next speaker is going to talk about diet, right? My biggest thing for diet is, for patients with cirrhosis, is to be eating six meals a day, complex carbohydrates, rice, pasta, noodles, potatoes, six meals a day, protein, 100 grams a day, no protein restriction, and low fat diet, because your body, as your liver gets sick, you have trouble digesting fat. If you follow those three rules, plus exercise, you can stay in much better general health, nutritional health, which gives you a better chance of making it to a transplant and surviving the transplant. Next question, microphone. There was a the woman here with the flowered shirt. When should a live donation be considered? I mean, when is it an option? So I'm going to go back to this MELD score for just a moment. The MELD score goes from 6 to 40. 6, you have no chance of dying of liver disease in the next year. All right? You have to have cirrhosis to calculate a MELD score in general. But 6 to 15, the risk of surgery is higher than the risk of not having surgery. So under 15, we're trying not to give any livers to anybody with MELD scores under 15 because why would you do something where you have a higher chance of dying, surgery, even though it's small, than just sitting tight. Once you're over 15, then you have what's called a transplant benefit. The chance of surgery helping you is better than not going to surgery. And then you have to take into account that live donors, when they're, sorry, Patients who are a recipient who are matched with a live donor, when they're really sick, their MELD scores up around 35 or 40, they don't do that well with live donor transplants just because of the complications of the anatomy and the hookup and the plumbing. So the ideal range to get a transplant from a live donor is a MELD score between 15 and 25. Some say 15 and 22, or 17 and 25, but let's say 15 to 25. That's that ideal window. And the best thing to think about with a live donor liver transplant is going to a center that's done more than 20. 20 is this magical number 
where suddenly the complication rates fall substantially for both the donor and the recipient. It's back to, I've moved a couple of times in my career and I've been looking for a surgical team that's excellent. I picked, because I'm living on the West Coast, Stanford because they've done a large number of liver transplants, adult live donor transplants with excellent results. And I think you as a patient think about the same thing. Think about live donor, you gotta pick out a center, it's in your geography, preferably, and find good quality, a good quality team, surgical team, medical team. Next question. Hi, I'm Rose. Um, about 15 years ago, I lost about 80 pounds, and um, I was doing really good. And then, about five years later, I was diagnosed with PBC fatty liver. Now, my question is, I have fatty liver because I was fat, or do I have, am I fat because I had fatty liver? Okay, what, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. All right, so fatty liver is also called NASH or NAS or NAFLD, is a condition that's driven by primarily your body weight. So when you gain weight, you put fat on your legs, on your tummy, and in your liver. So weight drives fatty liver. Now what drives weight? It's a balance between input and output. It's a bank account. If you put a lot in and you're not taking things out, you're gonna gain weight. Everybody can lose weight, everybody can treat, but it's hard because we have all these problems in our society. You get food signals everywhere you go. Everybody's eating all the time. There's always food available. That's not the way it was when we were cavemen or cave women. You had to go out and find your food. And you may not eat for three or five days till you kill the next mastodon you know, that's out in your neighborhood. So our society has changed to where we have endless food signals and endless food supply. And then their food quality has changed, right? We are bombarded by these synthetic sugars, these fructose and corn syrups that are part of what I call the agricultural conspiracy. They want to keep you hungry. When you eat simple sugars, you feel full, you feel good for an hour or two, and then you're hungry an hour and a half later, or really hungry two or three hours later. And then you go back and eat again, because you got food everywhere, and everybody says, you should be eating food, right? Food is part of all social interactions or going out to eat dinner or buffets. Third thing is these water bottles. Let's see, who's got one? I got one right here. I don't want to pick on anybody. So these water bottles have a triangle on the bottom. Anybody seen the triangle before? What does the triangle mean? What's in the middle of the triangle? What does the number mean? The kind of plastic. Yeah, and what's in the plastic? And what's the chemical called bisphenol that's in here? This has got a one on the bottom, and this is rich in bisphenols in the plastic, which then soaks into the water, then you drink the water, and that bisphenol changes your genes, it changes your genetics. And it changes them to make you insulin resistant so you store more fat. So the Canadian government, the US government, the French government have outlawed these plastics for babies. If it's bad for a baby, why is it good for you? So don't drink out of these bottles. Drink out of glass or metal. There are new plastics coming out that are called BPA-free. Who's heard of BPA-free plastics? Here's the conspiracy again, all right? So I, I emailed one of the companies recently and I said, you're BPA free, but are you BPS free? And they wouldn't answer my question. Mm -hmm. Because there's new bisphenols with had the other letters at the end of them. All right? So if you drink out of plastic, have your own plastic bottle that the water's in just for a few hours. It doesn't sit in it for a week or a month or a year out in the car in the trunk. It's 170 degrees. It's cooking the plastic and it gets full of these estrogens. That's what the bisphenol is. It's an estrogen and it changes your genetics. So back to losing weight. 
on my website, there's a weight contract that's 100% effective for people to lose weight. You sign the contract, you follow the contract, you will lose weight. It has never failed. And it does things like see a nutritionist. How many people in this room have seen a nutritionist? How many people have not seen a nutritionist? All right, that's about a 50-50 split. Everybody in this room, anybody if you've got liver disease, but in general, you need to see a nutritionist, and you need to see one who will help you with correct information. So what I usually tell people is take my weight contract into the nutritionist or my cirrhosis diet contract in to see a nutritionist and go over how to eat. So losing weight, you sign the contract, you count your calories, you eat less, you eat small meals. Even if you're not cirrhotic and you're overweight and you're trying to lose weight, you eat six snacks a day and you get rid of all these chemical sugars that are coming out of all these, um, you know, fructose and, and uh, the big gulp, you know, the giant things that are full of sugar. That's enough sugar for most people for a week in one of those containers. You exercise. You will not lose weight easily if you are not exercising. Running, speed walking, swimming, bicycling. Get your heart rate up over 100 for 20 minutes three times a week. Start changing your metabolism. Drink water. Your metabolism is sped up 20% when you're well hydrated. If you're not hydrated, it's shut down 20%. So just drinking lots of water with little electrolytes in it preferably speeds up your metabolism. But you can lose weight. Everybody can lose weight. You have to be motivated. You've got to change your behavior and you've got to fight this conspiracy that I'm describing. Because you are being poisoned by society, unfortunately. And you've got to fight those things. Vegetables, complex carbohydrates, good protein intake. All right, where's the microphone next, Buck? Could you talk a little bit about the physical process of transplant and immediate recovery processes? So what happens in the operating room? I think I've got a good picture on a slide up here because everybody likes looking at livers, right? So let's see, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna click ahead. There's just lots of information in this slide deck. Oh, can we turn the lights down in the room? This does not look good. If I'm this close, you definitely can't see this. Is there a light switch? Are you in control? All right. So <clears throat> the liver sits in the right upper abdomen, and I'm trying to see my red thing sits here. It's a very complicated organ. It's got a lot of plumbing hooked into it. Of course, there's this gallbladder that hangs off underneath that collects all the bile. And whenever you get a transplant, they always cut the gallbladder out. Not gonna work? No. All right, let's see if there's somebody else around who might help. Or maybe our AV person back there with a the camera might know. So underneath that liver, we have an artery that comes off the aorta. We have a vein that shoots all the way through the liver. So this vein is bringing blood back from the intestines and also from the legs, and the liver dumps into that vein, and right above the liver is the heart. Veins shoot, excellent job. That look better to everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Now isn't that the ugliest liver? Oh no, leave them down. <laughs> Thank you. That is a liver that looks like is somebody with PBC. Green, knobby, ugly. That PBC condition fills up that liver with bile. Hard, green, knobs. This looks more like a new liver. So a bit of a cartoon here. So they have to go into that abdomen, <clears throat> take out the old liver, cut off all those connections. And they have to do that really fast. There's two general methods of surgeons taking out that old liver. One is called the cut and run philosophy. That has been promulgated typically by the docs from Minnesota. Uh, some examples of people that use that are people at UCSF, um, Dr. Busatil at UCLA, I'm just kind of thinking West Coast for the moment. 
Um, <clears throat> there's another philosophy called veno-venous bypass, which is the technique that was originated in Pittsburgh by Tom Starzl, where they hook the body up to a couple of different uh, tubes that bypasses the liver during the surgery, decompresses the whole um, system below the liver, all those varices and veins and everything that are dilated. Now the cut and run is about an hour faster, but there's typically more blood loss than the decompression technique, which takes a little longer to set up, but it's really good for teaching and it's good for complicated cases because uh, there's less of bleeding. Those surgeons are really busy for three to six hours, depending on the surgeon, the surgical technique, and how sick the patient is. And they have to rehook up this vein, this vein, the artery, and the bile duct. There is a new technique called the piggyback technique, where they basically hook up the back of the liver to the recipient's vein, and they don't cut this vein up here and down here. They make a hole in the side of the vein, and then they hook the liver inside, side to side of the veins from the new liver with the recipient vena cava. The artery is a sensitive issue. It's this little blood vessel. It feeds 70% of the oxygen to the liver. And if the surgeon doesn't take good care of that artery, the artery clots off and you get what's called HAT, hepatic artery thrombosis. That should really only happen in three out of 100 transplants. And you can get this data off the internet. How good is that center that you might be interviewing with? Number one, what's the chance of dying in the operating room? That chance of dying on the table should be about one in 200 cases. That's good news, most people will get out of the OR. How good's the surgeon at connecting that artery? And that should be less than three in 100 where there's a hepatic artery problem. The bile duct, you can get strictures and different things in there. But really, where the bile duct might be a problem where it needs a reoperation should probably be about one in 100 cases. A lot of times they go back in if the, the bile duct's a little narrow and they can put a tube in by swallowing a camera or going through the skin. As I mentioned, the gallbladder is going to come out. There's usually not that much bleeding afterwards into the abdomen and afterwards, often now, the patient gets extubated in the OR or in the recovery room and then goes to the ICU or the floor. Back behind the liver is the pancreas, but that rarely gets touched. Over on this side, most of you all have heard about the spleen. The spleen can get quite big in people with liver disease as well as primary biliary cirrhosis. If you have the earlier form of the disease, which we're now moving towards this new term called primary biliary cholangitis, and by the way, I fully support this name change for a, a variety of reasons that you've heard from the PBCers. I think Robert gave you a good talk on Monday about that. Um, but once you have primary biliary cholangitis with cirrhosis, the spleen gets big, but usually the spleen is left in the body and not taken out because you like that spleen. That spleen keeps infections away from your body. Um, let me think if there's anything else on the surgery. This is a big scar down here. This looks like one that they were doing maybe five or 10 years ago. Sometimes there's just a little loop like this or this Mercedes scar as we call it is usually a little bit smaller. But this person may have needed a bigger incision for the extent of the surgery that was taking place. So hopefully that's a good, just quick rundown elevator speech on what the, the surgery looks like. Were there any specific questions on the surgery that, that people would have? I'm not a surgeon, but I've watched a number of cases and I've been involved with basically every surgical complication that okay. you could see. And maybe you could turn the lights up again. Would that be okay if someone's near the yep. switch and we can get back to some Q&A? Here we go. Hi, 
You were talking about the hepatic artery. Yes. Um, I have a question regarding mine. Um, I lost uh, my hepatic artery during a liver biopsy, and they put a coil embolization. Mm -hmm. So how would that impact surgery? Um, All right, so I don't know your case, but I'm just going to jump into what you've just told me. So when people do, get, do liver biopsies, we're putting this needle into the liver, which is a giant sponge and full of blood vessels, right? So people can bleed. And sometimes the needle goes a little bit too deep, meaning you get near a bigger artery, and that artery can start pumping blood out into your abdomen or your chest or other places. So if that starts happening, they go into the hepatic artery here with a little wire and a little tube, and they shoot a little metal coil, like a little spring, way out into the liver, wherever it's bleeding, and that coil just clots off that tiny little artery that's out there at the end. It's not going to sacrifice the big artery. Because if the big artery gets a hit, at least half of those patients are going to need another transplant, maybe more. That big artery feeds the liver. And more importantly, it feeds the bile tubes. And if you hit the big artery, the bile ducts start falling apart or getting scar tissue, and the liver looks back like primary biliary cirrhosis. You get a picture, it looks sort of like PSC. Also, primary sclerosis and cholangitis. So they probably got the tiny artery, not the big artery. That's my prediction, okay? Right hepatic artery. Right hepatic artery, right. It's not the big hepatic artery, but it's one of the right or the left or the right branch on the right. That's like a giant tree. It goes out and out and out and out. And it was, they, I'm sure they got one of the smaller ones that probably won't impact your life at all. You look good. <laughs> Next question. Um, this is going back a little bit, but um, when you said about going to a nutritionist, um, I was told if you have an autoimmune disease, even if you didn't have celiac, it might be good to do a gluten-free diet. And do you have any comments about that? So who in the room knows what celiac disease is? Raise your hand. Who does not know? All right, so celiac or sprue or celiac sprue or gluten sensitivity is when your body is allergic to a protein slash carbohydrate that's in wheat. You can have it in other grains as well, but wheat's sort of the bad actor. Less than three in 100 people in the United States have sprue. But then there's another seven out of 100 who are sensitive to sprue or sensitive to gluten. We don't completely understand why. And people with autoimmune diseases, PBC, primary biliary cholangitis, classic autoimmune hepatitis, or some other variant, have a higher frequency of gluten sensitivity, where the lining of the intestinal tract gets inflamed and people feel bad and they don't absorb fat and a variety of other things. So, Autoimmune disease, higher rate of sprue, higher rate of gluten sensitivity. My advice is go on a gluten-free diet for three months. If you feel better, then stick with it. It's more work, a little bit more expensive diet to be on, but it won't hurt you to be on a gluten-free diet. There's no downside to it other than the work involved with establishing that you know, kitchen habit. If you feel fine eating gluten? If you if you feel fine eating gluten and no one said you have sprue, either by blood tests or by an endoscopy where they do biopsies in the intestine, then go with it. The gluten sprue thing, in my opinion, is a little over-exaggerated in society right now. Remember back in the days and everybody had a yeast infection or everybody needed laser therapy for everything? You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a fad right now, probably a little over-amplified. But clearly, we've been missing people for the last 100 years who had it, and we missed the diagnosis. So let's find a middle ground by blood tests or by biopsy or by diet and figure out who should be on a gluten-free diet rationally. Who's on our next question? Please. If you've been diagnosed with portal hypertension, several bands, a couple of major ruptures, I've been afraid to exercise to get my heart rate over 100. Do I have any 
fear of that or should I just I, I can exercise as normal. That's not rational. You should be exercising. But we do tell people to avoid heavy weight lifting. So if you're going to 24-hour fitness, stay in the 20-pound weight range or less if you're doing weight lifting. Don't be doing giant lifts with barbells and things like that. That can increase the pressure in the abdomen and theoretically increase the chance of a rupture. That's never been proven, but just a little common sense behind that. Exercise, aerobic, is a little bit more important than weightlifting, but they're actually both important. We found out you gotta do both to keep in good shape. Um, there were some, Who's right talking? here. Okay, sorry. There were some centers of, I don't know how many years ago, that they were doing transplants where the livers weren't 100% perfect, like in a little older, um, patient. Right. Do you know, is, is that still going on today or is that oh, out? Yes. Oh yes. Okay. Every center is taking less than perfect organs because 12,000 people waiting, 6,000 organs. And because of all the seat belts and helmet laws and all the other things going on, donor quality is substantially less than it was before. And what's really hurting our donor quality is how much obesity we have in our society. So half the livers are fatty liver now because the donors are overweight or obese. So we're trying to make all society more healthy, including people who might get in a car accident, like them be way a little bit less so their liver quality is better. When the liver has fat in it, it doesn't withstand that storage period getting from point A to point B very well. The longer that is, the more fatty liver, the more likely the liver is to shut down. The other thing is what we call extended criteria donor or increased risk donors. So the worst case is you get a phone call, you're on the waiting list, and the surgeon said, well, we found Mr. or Mrs. Smith, or they may not tell you the gender, we found a patient who's a donor, but they were found unconscious at home with a needle in their arm. But the liver enzymes are perfectly normal. The liver looks really good. But that person, of course, with a needle in their arm, could have HIV or hepatitis B or C, right? So we had a huge discussion yesterday in San Francisco. I went to a whole meeting about these high-risk donors. And the chance of dying on the transplant list is 15%. I'll just give you that number. And the chance of getting a fatal disease, even from a high-risk donor, is about one in 2,000. So what door are you gonna go through, right? You're gonna trust that center to do the right blood tests on that donor. There's special tests, they're called PCR tests, or NAT testing to look for things like HIV, hepatitis B, or hepatitis C, or other really weird infections. There's a whole list of about 20 other things that donors have given to people, including rabies. You know, there was a rabies case. I think there's only been one, but it happened. And that person ended up, they didn't take the history very well. Are you playing with raccoons in the Appalachian Mountains? <laughs> and this guy was. He was out trapping raccoons and got bitten multiple times and got rabies. He gave donor, he gave organs to four patients. One of the four died a year later of the donation, of the transplant of rabies. They went back to the other three, none of them had apparent rabies. They weren't gonna do brain biopsies on them to find out. And they gave the other three people the immune globulin slash vaccine regimen to prevent rabies, and they're all three are alive today doing fine. So when you're facing a 15% chance of dying on the list and one in 2,000 of getting a weird disease, you should take those high-risk organs. Now the fatty organs are a little bit more complicated because it depends on the type of fat and the percent of fat in that donor and how long the transportation time was. So that's something you gotta negotiate with your um, surgical team because that's who's gonna call you in the middle of the night. But it's very low risk. Our system is set up to protect recipients. And there was a big case I heard about, about a patient in Chicago, a group of patients who got 
HIV and hepatitis C from a donor. The centers in Chicago did all the right tests, these tests I talked about, and they still missed it because of what's called a window period. It's a tiny, 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 tiny period where you might have negative tests, but they can transmit the disease. Um, and one of the patients sued, right? $30 million. Even though they had full informed consent when they were first consented, and they had full informed consent the day of the surgery. They still sued, and they lost. Because the informed consent was there, and the benefit outweighed the risk. You had full information, and there's this whole issue about risk-benefit. Okay. Microphone, please. Yes, I'm speaking on behalf of a PBC who's not here, but is a very dear friend of mine, and she has had two transplants. Her second transplant, she required, acquired a very severe peanut allergy. Hmm. And she also found out that the donor gave his heart, and the person who received his heart also received a peanut allergy. Are you finding more of that? Because they told her she was crazy in the beginning, and then they said suddenly they were finding more of it. And that was done in Canada, so. Okay. I think I've heard of a couple of those cases in the U.S. Let's say there's been 100,000 transplant, and there's been two or three cases like that. But when you acquire that donor organ, you're also acquiring part of their immune system. It's called chimerism, it's one of the fancy words for it. So if you get their immune cells, and their immune cells are revved up against peanuts, then you could acquire a peanut allergy. But that's not something I would worry too much about. It's back to this thing about dying waiting for an organ. That's the risk. That's the elephant in the room. I'm not worried about a cockroach in the corner. I'm worried about the elephant charging me, OK? Yes? Can you reverse fatty liver? You can reverse fatty liver by losing weight. Now there is these weird cases where people have fatty liver and they're not fat. That happens, that's probably four out of 100 people if you're gonna take 100 people with fatty liver. And they usually have some problem with insulin, diabetes, maybe a really high cholesterol, something else metabolically going on. But 96 out of 100 people have fatty liver from being overweight and they need to lose weight and the fat will come out. It's like it'll come out of the leg or the belly, it'll come out of the liver. And the damage that fatty liver causes can also reverse. By 2020, the leading cause for transplant in the United States will be fatty liver. Right now it's hepatitis C. Kind of depending on how you cut the cake, it's 40 or 50%. But what's happening in hepatitis C is we've got all these new drugs coming out that are curing hepatitis C. 80% cure, 90% cure, 96% cure rate. There'll be a whole set of new drugs between October and December of this year for hepatitis C. So there's going to be this massive shift away from hepatitis C towards fatty liver because fatty liver's maturing in terms of being around for 20 years, now everybody well, not everybody, but people who have it, a group are getting cirrhosis and cancer. If you've got NASH and PBC, lose weight, because at least the NASH part should decrease or go away. Please. Um, are there things that someone who has an earlier stage of PBC can do to slow the progression to cir cirrhosis, fibrosis, other than the standard or so? Okay. Is there diet or other things? So we talked about the most important issue, which is don't get overweight. Number two, don't drink alcohol. There is no safe level of alcohol for somebody with liver disease. Just that simple. Number three, do not smoke marijuana. Marijuana has been proven in prospective studies in people with liver disease. This was done in hepatitis C patients but I'm gonna translate it to all liver disease, that it causes more rapid progression of fibrosis. And you're already tired if you've got PBC, and it'll make you more tired. It's not gonna give you energy. I've never heard anybody saying, I smoke marijuana and I built a house. <laughs> right? It helps with nausea, it helps with sleep. It does have some medicinal qualities to it. But it has not been proven to be safe in anybody with liver disease. And we know the science behind 
marijuana, the tetrahydrocannabinoids, go into the liver, attach to the cells that form scar tissue, and stimulate them like crazy. In two studies in France, people had hepatitis C, and they quantitated how much marijuana they were smoking. You can imagine how much trouble they had getting people to enroll in that study, right? It sped up the scar progression substantially, statistically. Two separate studies. So in animals, in cells, in humans, marijuana is bad for people with liver disease. I'm fully for legalizing it and taxing it like crazy and making new highways and building new schools. But if you're sick and you've got another disease, you sh specifically liver disease we're talking about, I'm not talking about other things, people should not smoke marijuana. So lose weight, no alcohol, no marijuana, those are going to influence your general health and your liver health and can slow down your disease. And hopefully this new intercept drug will be approved by the FDA and that'll be the next generation. The other thing is, is that you need to have your provider work you up for autoimmune hepatitis we were talking about before. Because there are people with an overlap between PBC, primary biliary cholangitis, and classic autoimmune hepatitis or something called autoimmune cholangitis. Or if you've got PBC and sprue and you treat the sprue by going on a gluten-free diet, in my opinion, that may slow down your liver disease because you don't want two liver diseases. You don't even want one, but if you have a choice of two or one, you want one, not two. All right? Next microphone. Yes? Two questions, if I may. Uh, the easier one is, could you tell us something about what happens after transplant? The recovery process, what's required, and okay. duration. The second one was, I hear all these references to trying to lose weight. And I would think the sicker you get, the less interested you are in eating. Like I've lost 30 or 40 pounds without trying. Right. And but and I've heard no reference to sodium Okay. anywhere so here. I'll take the second question first. If you're really overweight and suddenly you are terribly fatigued and your diet patterns are to consume a certain number of calories every day, you don't lose weight, even though you're sick. It becomes even harder to lose weight for some people when they're really sick. They just can't burn the calories and they need some nutritional intake every day to keep their muscle mass up and other things. Sodium, you need to be on a low sodium diet. That's it, follow the cardiac rules for low sodium. That in general is what you need to be if you've got a liver, liver problem, very simple rules. Post-transplant, patients should be in general out of the hospital in an average of eight days. Some are in three months and some get out and three to five days afterwards. But eight days is a typical average for a good center. And I'll give you a little bit of a range, eight to 12 days, but less than two weeks. Uh, recovering back to normal, well, a lot of people don't know what normal is because they've had, say, PVC for 10 or 20 years, and they've been tired for 10 or 20 years, and you'd like to be back completely to normal. And I always tell my patients to expect to get back to 80% of what you think is normal. In other words, if you want to build five houses, only build four. If you want to play 18 holes of golf, play nine. Just cut back what your expectations are even after transplant. There was a recent study done in primary biliary cholangitis patients who had cirrhosis, who went to transplant, and they said, are you tired after transplant? They have these very sophisticated scoring systems for fatigue. And it showed in this study that people with PBC don't ever get back to what's considered normal for energy. So even after a transplant, there's something reset in the body that leads to a persistent state of fatigue. But if you're running at 40, 40, 40, you want to be at 100, you get a transplant, you're going to probably get up to 60 or 70. But don't expect to get all the way back to normal. If you do, have a party. But if you don't, say, okay, I went from 40 to 70. That's a lot better than 40, because at 40, I wasn't doing much. At 70, I can do most of my 
things I want to get done and maybe go back to work at a reasonable job. Recovery after transplant includes physical rehabilitation, accelerating nutritional intake, and in PBC patients, you've got to take care of your bones, not just before, but after transplant. You heard from the previous speaker about bone health. Calcium, vitamin D, supplements. Make sure your vitamin D level, 40 to 50 range, not what the lab tells you of 20 to 30. Exercise is good for bones. Have a good calcium intake in your diet. Wound healing. Uh, psychological issues. If you're depressed, either go for psychotherapy or get on antidepressants. That will improve your energy state. If you've got a bad sleep problem, get on sleep aids. There's a lot of different safe or reasonably safe sleep medications. If you're sleeping well at night, you're going to feel better during the day. Part of the fatigue with PBC, in my opinion, is people don't have good sleep habits. They don't sleep well at night. I don't want to take any more medicine, so I'm going to be miserable. Go to your doc, go to your provider, and ask for help with sleep. There's a very, very, very safe sleeping aid called trazodone. Mm -hmm. T-R-A-Z-A-D-O-N-E. It's an antidepressant, but it's not really used for depression. It's used to help people sleep. Right. And it has good, what's called REM sleep. It allows you to dream. Mm. In fact, some people get nightmares from it. So if you do, you have yeah. to stop it. But you dream. Your REM sleep is good. That's healthy sleeping. Yeah. A lot of these other medicines that people take, like Ambien or, well, there's a whole slew of sleep aids. You always see at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're up, right? They're trying to sell sleeping pills to you. Those decrease REM sleep. So you should start with trazodone, or sometimes you can use a little trazodone with one of the other sleeping aids. But you should be sleeping six and a half to seven hours a night of good sleep and be dreaming, a good dream cycle. You sleep, you'll be healthy. Buck, where's the next mic? Right here. Yes. Uh, can you talk about the transplant evaluation process? Like, when do we get there? Do you have to be on the transplant list first, or is it by MELT score? Or? To get a transplant, you need to be on a list. To get on a list, you need to be referred. So your primary care provider, gastroenterologist, those are typically the two pathways. And I'm saying provider, not physician, because Many of us are being taken care of by nurse practitioners or PAs. That's the new wave, as you know. So your provider, your gastroenterologist gets you into a transplant center. And we typically ask for referrals when people have a MELD score of around 15, because that's when we're thinking about listing people. But you have the right to go to a transplant center with a lower MELD score, or if you've had a big GI bleeding episode like the woman described here, or there's something else terrible going on. You're itching like crazy and you can't get the itching under control. How many people here in the room have itching that has not been resolved by your provider? Raise your hands. Raise your hands up. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So itching is something, we're talking about quality of life. You're not going to get a transplant for quality of life, but often getting to a liver center they can treat your itching. Because there are, I have an itch list that's got 14 medicines on it. And my success at getting somebody's itching under control, meaning 80 or 90% better, is over 95%. Because there are great medicines for itching out there. This obeta-colic acid that's coming out may help with itching too. Although, in, as you know, in one of the studies at the higher dose, the itching got a little worse. But there are great drugs for itching, great medications that'll help you sleep and help with your itching. So a liver center may help you with that. And I'm gonna post my itch list on my website soon. So if you sign up for my newsletter or go to my website, you can download that itching list. Uh, it may, may help you with your provider. Um, what else about referral? Yeah. Once you get to a transplant center, and you're, let's, tell, let's say they tell you you're not quite ready to be listed, you should be in touch with them every three to six months about your status update and tell them, my MELD score is still 10, I'm getting along okay. My MELD score has jumped from 10 to 15 or 16. I need to come back in to get on the transplant list. 
That meld of 15 is the standard now nationally to get listed and get on that number. And then you're going to be waiting for a while. It depends on where you are geographically in the US. If you're in New Orleans, you might wait a year or two. If you're on the West Coast, you might wait two or three or four years, depending on that MELD score. But you should have regular follow-up with your transplant center in combination with your local provider, primary care or gastroenterologist. Is that enough detail for you? Is that okay? All right. So next question, yeah. we can get back to just what, raise your hand. Excuse me. What are the antib antibiotics you will recommend for people uh, who have PBC? And what, which medicine are you asking about? The antibiotics. Antibiotics for PBC. So we don't treat PBC with antibiotics, right? Because yeah. we don't think it's an infection. Although there's a doctor in Canada who claims there's a virus that causes PBC. His name is Dr. Mason. He's doing research to maybe figure that out. But there is one antibiotic we use for itching, all right? And that's called rifampin or rifampicin. And the reason that this rifampin or rifampicin works is because it acts on the enzyme system that causes itching. What causes itching? What's, what's the chemical? Does anybody know? That's the old theory. That's wrong. Bile acids are not the primary cause of itching. It's not. It can make it a little worse. It can be added on top, but it is not the primary cause. The primary cause is lysophosphatidic acid. Do you love that name? L-Y-S-O-P-H-O-S-P-H-A-T-I-D-I-C. Lysophosphatidic acid. This chemical is a fatty derivative that is made by an enzyme called autotaxin. Auto like automobile, taxin like you pay taxes, T-A-X-I-N. Rifampin changes the activity of the autotaxin and decreases lysophosphatidic acid. So rifampin is one of my key great drugs to treat itching. My favorites are rifampin, periactin, atarax, which doesn't work for everybody, and doxepin. Then finally, number five is primrose oil, which you can buy at health food stores, and you can take it over the counter. That five those different of those five, they all help. And doxepin is fantastic for sleep. So if you're itching and you can't sleep, go to your provider and ask for a doxepin prescription. Itching during the day, if Atarax has failed, ask for periactin. These are all medicines that are in, really in any pharmacy that have very few side effects. But we don't use antibiotics to treat this disease in general. We're gonna use Urso, Hopefully, this new obeta-cholic acid will get approved. If you have an overlap between PBC and autoimmune hepatitis, we might give you prednisone or Imuran to treat an overlap. But overlaps are maybe in one out of 10 people. In general, we don't use immune suppressants for PBC because the side effects of the immune suppressants are worse than the disease. People take prednisone, they get cataracts and obese and break bones and other things. So Ursos are mainstay. There's a lot of newer drugs coming in that they're experimenting with and my advice is wait for more details or see your PBC expert about whether you wanna go on those drugs. There's another one called phenofibrate. Looks really exciting, uh, but the studies right now are pretty small. We don't have really good data to use it and I can't make a broad recommendation for that yet. All right, question. Uh, you were talking about the chances of getting a transplant in California and New Orleans. What about the Midwest? So the Midwest is really big. 
and it includes the Mideast, right? That's why I hate that word Midwest, because most of the Midwest is in the East, right? In Ohio. So it depends on where you are. And you can go on, and there's a map. I'll, actually, I'll show you a map of the organ uh, maldistribution. Let's see. Where is my map? All right, so this is an interesting graph. And it basically says that if you have a meld of 40, your chances of getting a transplant in 90 days in this OPO is 20%. And in this OPO, it's 80%. Isn't that a terrible distribution? That's not fair, right? So let's see if I can get to a map. Uh, nope, I just have to go back. I think I went too far forward. Hold on a second. Oh, here we go. These are the different regions in the country. And I guess maybe that is a good graph to talk about. Just the difference. I'm sorry, this thing's going too fast. This is the difference by meld category. And I thought I had a graph on here about by the regions. So um, in region three, your chance of getting an organ is really, really high. If you're in region seven and then you're, you're in Chicago, your chance of getting an organ is really, really low. Now what's happened is in region seven, they're now sharing across the whole region for a meld over 35, so there's not much difference. But the south in three, 11, and eight have the lowest meld score at the time of transplant and the highest chance of getting a, trans, a transplant. Uh, New York and California, really high meld scores and much lower chance at getting a transplant at any meld score. But this is all gonna be redrawn, I believe, by 2016. And the only bad place in the country when they redraw this is going to be California. It'll still have the worst and lowest chance of getting an organ at any meld score. And you go, why is California so bad? They're always on the cutting edge of everything, right? The problem in California is, is there's a big disparity between how many people will have liver disease, a lot of people with liver disease, and the donation rate. So a lower donation rate relative to how many people are sick. And the new rule is limiting the transportation time to three hours. So it's hard to get an organ from New Orleans to San Francisco in three hours. It's a, over a three hour flight time and then you've got to get the organ harvested and then get it to the recipient. So the next wave is getting better preservation solutions to expand the preservation time out to 20 hours. And if they go to 20 hours, they're gonna make the whole country just one big distribution zone. And then you can go from Maine to LA or Seattle on a commercial Southwest flight for 60 bucks, right? A little box with a liver in it. So we have a problem with preservation time for organs, and that's why we can't make the country one big share. But that might happen by maybe 2020. Doc, we've got one last question. Yeah, what time is it? I've got to go. We're coming up on the so, so, Sorry? It's the last one. 11 minutes after 11. All right, so I've got to go give my next talk across town. All right, please. Um, do you have a list of good drugs for fatigue, good uh, treatments? So there aren't very many. Um, my number one is correct the sleep problem. There's a list of sleep aids. Number two, treat depression if it's present. Number three, I prefer Pete's coffee over Starbucks. But caffeine is good. Caffeine's healthy for the liver. We know that, right? Brings liver tests down. Drink it in the morning, not at night. That's wave three. And number four, you heard from our previous speaker about pro-vigil or new vigil. Those are really good drugs. I think the addiction potential is really tiny. I had one patient, and I've probably given those to over 100 patients. I've only had one patient who I think got addicted to those. 
It's like morphine. If you've got a, your leg's been chopped off and you've got pain there, you don't get addicted to morphine because you're treating the pain. If you're fatigued and you're taking these pills for fatigue, it's really hard to get addicted to the pills. You are using the pills for a problem and you feel better on them and you come off, you feel bad, but that's not really addiction. That's because the medicine's working, right? You can take that. So that's kind of my four phases of treating fatigue. They're pretty simple. All right, I think that's our last one. Buck, you want to do a wrap up? Yep, I do. Dr. Right. Gish, thank, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Get this rid of. You have your control thing back. And I'm going to leave cards up here for people. You. And you want the microphone, right? And I want to oh. give you this. Thank you so much. And the question and answer, I think Q&A was a terrific format. Great. And a great way to end up on conference. And I'm sorry I didn't show you all my slides. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, Doc.